Welcome to March's Tech of the Month. This month, we're going to be discussing Tim Wellen's potentially rule-bending handlebar modifications, Australia Cycling's report into their failed handlebars at the Tokyo Olympics, and of course, we'll be looking at the new products that are soon to be dropping very soon. First, though, we've got a few quick news stories. Uh, Michelle, uh, I think Ridley have released something new and exciting. Can you tell us a bit more? So, Belgian brand Ridley has come out with new versions of its Helium and its Noah bike. They've dubbed this the Essential Series, which kind of reminds me of the Waitrose uh, or overheard in Waitrose um, and the essential Waitrose Mascarpone. But I can see where they're going um, in that, you know, where MV brought out its foundation line and Zip brought out the likes of the 303S. So they're looking to create a slightly more affordable version of its uh, premium products. They've done this by using a different grade carbon. It is a bit heavier. Um, but the helium frame, which is designed as the, the lightweight climbing bike, is still under a kilo. Um, I mean, compared to the SLX, that's 780 grams on that one. So you're, it's about 200 grams difference. Yeah. The Noah starting at 3369 and the helium at 2909. So it is a reduction in price on their really top end frames. Whether it's necessarily an essential series price is, is questionable. I'll, I'll let the viewers decide. Um, but it is nice to see that they've brought that price down a bit. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, I mean, being, especially with that Elite Series that's been used by the top end pros, it makes it a whole lot more available to uh, you know an even bigger market, which is only a good thing, I think. So then I think next up, we've got Simon with some new shoes that have been spotted. Can you tell us about those? Yeah, so spotted on the feet of Matteo van der Poel and Jasper Philipsen are some new Shimano shoes that we think are probably the new flagship S Fires. And as the current ones are called the Aspire RC902, these are probably going to be the 903s. They don't look all that different, actually. They still have the two boas, um, but what is different about them is that they have two little boa lace loops at the bottom on the toe box underneath. Um, and they have a white heel cup rather than the silver one. So overall, some pretty small changes, and but they do have a much cleaner look to them. They do, and I think probably the, the little change, this, this is the way a lot of shoes are going at the moment, the specialised Aries, S-Works Aries that were released last year. Um, they're going for a much more locked in sort of look and feel. Um, and obviously that's really important for sprinting, for, for hard efforts, uh, but you've got to keep that comfort there. And the S-Fires are famously comfortable, so it looks as if just a little bit of extra locked-in feel on the toe box is going gonna, is gonna to be a little, little bit of a, a, an improvement. Next up, Verve have released the most expensive power meter on the market, and the price is something we'll get to in a moment, but I'll just chat you through some of the headline figures. Now, it's been made by Metron Additive Manufacturing, who in the past have been making components for the likes of Team Sky and Ineos and Team GB. So they've got a pretty good base in kind of the UK scene. As the name would suggest, they're 3D printed out of titanium, meaning there's not that much excess material and the strength can be built up exactly where it's needed. Now, the impressive thing about this power meter is that it's capturing cadence data every thousandth of a second and it's also taking torque values 250 times a second as well. So it's a whole lot of data and they say that it makes it incredibly accurate. However, they're pretty vague when it comes to power accuracy because they're simply saying it's less than 1%. Now, compared to other power meters on the market, which can often be, you know, plus minus 1%, you'd, it's, you'd hope that they would claim something a bit more specific. Especially when you can say you're recording cadence 256 times a second. If you've got that granular data, mm. can we not have some more granular data on how accurate the power meter is? This is exactly it. So that's something I think you would especially hope for. Okay, so how are they justifying this price? What makes it better than other power meters? So that's a really good question. And the main thing is that because of their manufacturing process, they can position those strain gauges in a way that only measures the tangential forces, which are those obviously the ones responsible for pushing you forwards. Now, the other good thing about that is that they don't need calibrating and they also don't need any algorithms to kind of measure that data and um, process it. The silver lining on that price though is that unlike many other power meters on the market, this power meter, because you don't see those strain gauges, it's an incredibly attractive one and it does just look really cool. Now, that's not a justification for the price, but it definitely helps. Now, getting onto that price, they are currently listed they're only doing a track version at the moment, but that one's coming in at £4,750, so a pretty punchy price. In dollars, that is 6450 I think it's fair to assume, especially with their previous history with Team Sky and Team GB, I think really what they're doing here is just kind of bowing down to that UCI rule of making sure that whatever gear is used by a national squad is available commercially. So I don't think you can read too much into that price. Um, however, road versions will be coming in the springtime. Again, 
prices aren't confirmed on that, but I think it's fair to assume that they're going to be pretty close to where that track chain set is. Um, but yeah, we'll see what they come out with. Um, either way, they do just look pretty cool. So Tim Wellens riding for Lotto Sudal has had a pretty impressive start to the season. He's won both a stage and also a one day race. Um, but being the tech team, we're less interested in his race results and more interested in what he is riding. Um, and so we noticed that his handlebars have some pretty interesting modifications. Now, he does like to ride in that kind of position with the shifters in, in a really sort of nice aero crouch, which makes all the sense in the world, actually saves a lot more watts than most equipment, um, just positioning it in that way. Um, however, the UCI obviously made it more difficult last year by banning positions um, such as a puppy crouch when the rider's hands are over the bars. Um, but when we look at his handlebars, he seems to have two kind of humps underneath the bar tape. Um, and it's as though he's, I, I don't know, we don't know yet what it is that he's actually placed under there, but almost, you know, like a foam or something just to allow him to get a bit more cushioning um, and still be within the UCI rules whilst adopting that position. So the regulation is there just to make sure that the rider is actually holding the brake levers and can operate the brake levers uh, as opposed to going like that. And he still can with those, uh, even though there's humps on the top, on his bar tops, he can still do that, can't he? And he has been photographed still holding the brake levers. So going from Tim Wellen's handlebars to Australia's cycling's handlebars, they released their report on what happened at the Tokyo Olympics. Now, I think we can all remember what happened when we were, it was in the team pursuit, wasn't it? And all of a sudden, the guy at the back's bars just disappeared basically underneath him and he went down pretty hard. So um, they've done their report into it and now we have a better idea of actually how that came to be. Um, the base bar itself was made by Bastion um, and that was made by 3D printing. Um, and the report found that the National Trike Cycling Team provided an inadequate specification for custom-built handlebars as well as failing to conduct adequate fatigue testing. So basically Australia cycling themselves, they haven't pushed the blame on Bastion. They've actually said, no, we didn't do the proper checks. We didn't look into it properly enough. And essentially we allowed our rider to ride something that was kind of substandard. So I, so I think that's probably something quite good from the cycling body to admit to, um, because it clearly the issue was with them. Um, it does bring us onto that wider question though of kind of niche parts being used at these kind of high level competitions. We've had issues where um, products created via 3D printing haven't necessarily met UCI standards. Um, and there's been confusion between the UCI and the brand as to whether or not the item is UCI legal. And I'm not talking about Bastion here, it was a different brand, yeah. um, but it, it has been a problem. Um, and brands, as you said, like Trek and Giant and Specialized, they're used to these forms. They're used to what you have to do in order to jump through the UCI's hoops. And the UCI puts those hoops in to keep riders safe to an extent. Um, and so they know how those forms need to be completed. They know when. And if you're going to open a mould that's going to cost you half a million, you're going to make damn sure that you've ticked all the right boxes. But if you're creating one-off items via 3D printing, then you haven't sort of invested quite so much and therefore you may not have those procedures in place. And, and that's something that just needs looking at. Does that answer the larger question though of, should we have 3D printed parts being used or by national federations? Should they just be sticking to these mass produced parts? I think uh, the, 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 it, it's difficult to test individual parts, but, um, but I, I guess really there needs to be some kind of safety net built in and I think the, the Bastion bar um, wasn't really built to withstand the forces um, that broke it in the end, um, just because of this mistake with the specification. But I think probably if you can get the specification exactly right, um, the experts in 3D printing, Bastion and Metron, who we talked about earlier, um, ought to be able to make a part that withstands the, the forces as long as they're specified correctly, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. That's fair. You think how many, how many 3D parts have been used? I bet if you were to look at the Olympic track bikes across all of them, there's going to be a lot of that. And we're focusing on one failure. That doesn't mean to say that we think that 3D parts, full stop, are a problem. They're not at all. There's just potentially more open to there being a problem if the standards aren't correctly set out. So we had two new products launch this last month, both from Wahoo. We had both the Wahoo Powerlink pedals um, and also the Wahoo Roller. You guys have tested them both. Tell me a bit about first the pedals. Yeah, I, I really like the, the new Wahoo Speedplay pedal that they launched last year. And so I've actually really been looking forward to the power meter version. Um, and 
It's not exactly the same as the Speed Play Zero because they've had to make a few modifications to make it into um, to make it fit basically. So the stack height has gone up by 1.5 millimeters, um, and the axle length has also increased by something like two millimeters. And that's just so that the the cleat clears it when you're clipping in and out because it has the little pod um, at the end of the spindle. Um, for me, uh, it just felt exactly like using Speed Play pedals. Um, and I was just, uh, the, the charging is great. It's got this Y-shaped cable that clips onto both the pedals really easy. Everything about them is like pretty much as you'd expect from Wahoo because, you know, they, they're they all about usability and uh, simplicity and, uh, and they're, all, they're all that. Um, the, I had a little bit of an issue at first with them um, under reading and that's because I wasn't um, able to have a look at the instructions on the Wahoo Fitness app because I was a beta user still at that time. So they underread the first time I used them. I had a quick call with Wahoo and they gave me access to the app properly so I was able to calibrate them, do the sprints that you have to do to settle them, which probably is basically to bend them a bit so, so that, uh, so, and before they're reading accurately. And then I did the John's Short Mix workout on Zwift um, and I just got really amazing accuracy actually for the 220 watts, uh, which is for me sweet spot, um, the, for 10 minutes the Wahoo read 220 watts and so did the watt bike that I was comparing them against, which I know is accurate. There was a little bit of a discrepancy at the at the top end for the sprints, um, but this is only basically the first time I've ever tested them. So um, you know, I'm not going to draw any conclusions at this point. I'm going to carry on and see what happens. Do a bit more testing. Take them outside as well. But so far, really impressed. I really like them. Interesting though, that you found in in those sprints, and as you said, it was the first time, and you might find different in the next couple of rides. But um, the, the one who actually read slightly lower, slightly lower, yeah, yeah, which is odd, yeah, considering because, the position. Yeah, yeah, you'd expect it to read higher if anything, just because it's like at the direct point where you're putting forth onto the the bike. Um, so yeah, it was a little bit of a surprise, but um, as I was saying, it's only the first first time, or, or really the, the the first time I tested them, having properly calibrated them. So I'll see what happens in the future. And they come out really well in terms of weight, don't they, compared to competitors? Yeah, they're under 300 grams. Um, the, none of the other direct competitors, which are the Favero Asioma and the Garmin Rally, neither of them are under 300 grams for the pair. Um, but that's because the speed play has the, the little lollipop shape and the, the cleat is obviously on the, the shoe. So that's where the weight is. Um, so yeah, they're light, but you know, you've got to take the cleat into account as well. And I'm, I'm so pleased they've gone with that charging option. That's just music to my ears because there's no there's no replacing batteries. There's no possible holes for water and grass, right? Yeah, exactly yeah, that. Yeah, it, it's really easy. The, I, I was really impressed with the charging. It just you've got these little sort of clips that snap onto the pedals, and uh, like with most Wahoo things, you've got LEDs. So you've got some green flashing LEDs when it's charging, and they go solid when it's charged. And um, the same for connecting for pairing. You've got the blue lights and red for when the power is getting low and you can see them um, see them from above really clearly as well so it, it, they're just really easy to use they're great now the other product was interesting um, and we've got this this new roller initially I, I wasn't sure there was a need for this um, it's it's an interesting product but actually being 21 weeks pregnant I'm kind of I haven't ridden my, my rollers very much um, and I do miss them a bit. So maybe, maybe this is the answer. Um, but that's quite a niche audience. So tell us a bit about this roller. So uh, to be honest, I was exactly the same. I was wondering where they were going to sit in the market and what they were really going to be like. But when I got them and when we started to film the video of, you know, unboxing them and putting them together, I was so surprised. One, at how easy it was to put together. Um, they literally slid together a couple of screws and you're done. And then I could drop my bike on, set the wheelbase. Like the setup genuinely couldn't have been quicker. And that was really surprising because I was expecting it to be a lot more faff. Um, and then, yeah, tightening up the wheel, really easy. Um, the only thing I'd recommend is making sure that the A-frame goes as close to the head tube as possible, just because then it makes it as sturdy as possible. Um, but then one of the things that Wahoo were really stressing with the roller was the ride feel. And that's something that I definitely got from these was just how smooth it was and it was just the little bit of a sway on the back wheel that you get which was really nice and it made it feel a whole more a whole lot more natural than um say a normal conventional trainer um so i think for people that do kind of are maybe a bit bored of being like locked in um or just don't have a trainer yet i think it's a great option and i think just as 
I think it can be easy to think of rollers as that thing you use before to warm up before a race. However, if you don't have a smart trainer and you want to get one, I think this is a, just a great option to have um, as an alternative to you know your standard trainer um, because it did just feel really nice. And once you do have them paired with any power meter because they will connect to any amp plus or Bluetooth power meter, that's when you unlock the full range of abilities. Um, but you've still got your gears. So even if you did want to use them on the side of the road, you can. Um, so they do make a whole lot more sense than originally I was giving them credit for. Mm. But they weigh, um, they're, they're pretty heavy, aren't they? Like yes. 22.6 kilos. Yes. They're, um, they're how are... easy is it to lift out of the car? Yeah, so that's one kind of downside about them is that they are, they're slightly bulky. Um, and yeah, that flywheel by itself is 10 and a half kilos. Although that A-frame does fold flat, you can't really pop it anywhere. You can't put it in a cupboard. You can't kind of fold in the legs and put it away. Once it's on the floor, it's staying on the floor. Um, the fact that you can separate the two parts and put it in a car, for example, or just lie it flat in the, in the boot, that means you could, in theory, use them on the side of a road to warm up for a race. Um, but it's just a bit clunky and a bit awkward and quite heavy. So whether people will actually do that, I'm not confident. Um, but as a trainer, and I think that's how you've got to see them, as a trainer, Absolutely great. I can't see a track riders. So I used to go to like a track league with a bike on one hat and uh, rollers, rollers on, the on the other. You get those people with the little trolleys, track geek trolleys, yeah. um, and they put everything in there. But <laughs> I don't think track geek trolleys can take 22 kgs worth of <laughs> worth of roller. But what I do think is interesting, though, is they've said that the if you're not using a, a power meter to go with it, um, the power reading isn't quite as accurate. And certainly I've got the elite uh, rollers and they do give you a power reading, but it's really inaccurate and that's what I put in my review and everyone else that's reviewed them has kind of said the same. So that's quite interesting. What's the experience like if you have not got a power meter because the resistance does, you can increase it, right? So this is one thing where um, they say that you can unlock two levels of resistance when there's no power meter connected. Now, when I tried them, I couldn't find how to do that. So, but that being said, when I dropped the bike on and I was using it, the res level of resistance that was there kind of as stock was fine. And because I still have my gears, I could still, you know, use my gears as I usually would. So I believe there are two levels of resistance. I wasn't, I didn't work out how to find them, but apparently they're there. Um, I think though, if you're going to buy these, you do need to have that power meter because you're really underutilizing them um, as kind of a smart trainer and unlocking all of the other features. So if you've already got a power meter, great. You only have to spend £700 in the UK to get them. Um, but I think it's essential that you do have a power meter, essentially. Really. With, without the power meter, it's just like dumb rollers, isn't it? Basically, yeah. Yeah, just very heavy dumb rollers. So it's time for Bike of the Month. Simon, what have you got for us? Okay, so I've got the Pearson Summon the Blood, um, which is of course taken from the Once More Unto the Breach, dear friends, from Henry V. You knew that, didn't you? Of course, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. yeah so the frame is made from uh, titanium, painted, painted titanium, which is kind of unusual. It's quite a, a striking looking bike with the paint there. Um, 3AL 2.5V um, buttered titanium, which means it's gonna give a really comfortable ride. Um, and it's got those, the, the classic looks as well that you can sort of expect from that nice straight tubing. So tell me about that tyre clearance. Yeah, so it's got clearance for 45 millimetre tyres, which means you should be able to tackle some pretty gnarly gravel on it if you want to. Cool, and I guess there's actually one main headline feature of this bike. Yeah, what there is. is. Um, so it's got the classified hub on it, which is the two-speed electronic hub. And this actually is not offered as a production bike yet by Pearson. And so this is a special model we've got here. The rest of the group said his GRX Di2. So what do you think of that classified system? Do you think it's actually good or is it a bit of a fad? Well, I don't think it is a bit of a fad. And actually, uh, I was talking to Pearson about it last night. I was in the shop last night and Will Pearson was saying that he really expects um, this, maybe not this actual hub, but you know, the, that kind of a, a two-speed hub to be really, to become mainstream in the, in the next few years. They think it could even be taken up by a bigger component manufacturer, maybe Shimano, who knows. Um, but he really thinks that it is something that really works really well. And as we know, it does work really well and, uh, and is probably here to stay. But, but I think at the, at the moment, um, it, it would be useful if you could buy it as a hub only rather than as a complete wheel set because Classified only offer two wheel sets. Um, and you know the choice to build it onto your own rim really ought to be ought to be there. And it's only really going down that method of being able to sell it as a hub only that it's going to be able to reach a mass market really. I think so. Yeah. So it might need somebody else to take it on really and to offer more rims with it. 
but otherwise really nice bike though isn't it yeah it is it, it's a lovely really well. bike i actually had that um just in my uh, in my kitchen for a while and uh, just kind of looking at it admiring it and it, it is a, it is a lovely bike and i love that paint job on it actually yeah. and i think that um sort of half painted half uh, nude titanium is a really nice look yeah well there we have it that's all for tech of the month this march if you enjoy the video drop it a like subscribe to the channel for more content and we'll see you again very soon And let me read it out here. It says, the riding position shall be set so that the competitor has good forward vision when in a competitive position. <laughs> <laughs> oh, incredible. Right. Oh. <gasps>